I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, I'm so pleased that this event is finally happening, uh, the US premiere of Franz Liszt's uh, Sardinopolo, um, a, an opera that you're going to hear uh, quite a bit about from uh, David Trippett uh, momentarily. I just wanted to take a quick moment. Uh, first of all, my name is David Plyler. I'm with the uh, music division at the Library of Congress. Um, and I just want to thank our artistic partners in this, who put this event together um, in such a wonderful way over such a long period of time. And this includes, uh, first and foremost, David Trippett, who actually did the editing and realization of this work that you're about to experience. Um, and uh, with the University of Cambridge, a very fine pianist and speaker, and um, uh, you'll find out just what he did with this uh, work. Um, I'd also like to thank Robert Ainsley and Ken Weiss uh, uh, from the Domingo Caperts Young Artist Program at the Washington National Opera. Um, they've assembled a, an amazing cast that you're about to hear um, and just been wonderful to work with. Um, also, Thomas Colohan, um, the director of the Washington Master Chorale, um, has put together a great chorus that's for the uh, chorus of concubines as you'll hear at the beginning of the piece. Um, and I'd also uh, like to thank um, an anonymous donor who actually funded this uh, entire project here at the library on, on our side. And we're really grateful for um, your willingness to kind of go with us uh, to make this happen. Um, so if you'd uh, all uh, Sardinopolis join me in uh, welcoming uh, David Trippett. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and a privilege for me to be here with you uh, this afternoon in one of the world's largest archives. By definition, rummaging in archives can yield the unexpected. Yet even so, it's rare, I think, to discover uh, that an unknown opera by a major 19th century composer has effectively been hiding in plain sight. But that's exactly what I'd like to present to you today. Here's the manuscript. This is how it was presented in uh, a German newspaper, uh, sort of the equivalent of the National Enquirer. Um, but you can, you can, the reason I show it is because uh, it gives you a sense of the size. It's not a large manuscript. Um, Liszt worked for seven years on and off to compose an Italian opera. It was central to his ambition to attain status as a great European composer alongside Rossini, Meyerbeer, and the young Wagner. But he abandoned it after the first act, and the music he completed has lain silently uh, in the Goethe and Schiller archive in Weimar for nearly 170 years. It was ambitious, and as he saw it, a potentially career-defining enterprise. It would have left us with a major opera at the peak of his fame and artistic powers a little like Beethoven leaving us with only the first movement of the Pastoral, or uh, Verdi, Act I of Don Carlos. The world premiere of Act I took place last summer in Weimar, but beyond those in the hall, few have heard the music. I think I speak for all the musicians and scholars involved when I say that the music has appeared to us as a kind of unexpected gift, uh, 52 minutes of entirely new music, uh, by one of the most famous musicians of the 19th century. This afternoon, I'd like to tell you about the unlikely path that led to this resurrection, the questions, the challenges, and so on. Liszt's brief career as an operatic composer is rarely taken seriously today. His only completed opera, Don Sange, is typically classed as an unsuccessful work of dubious authorship. All other, well, he was 13, 14 at the time, and his father, Adam, had encouraged him to copy Mozart's travels across Europe, and he wanted this work to be uh, a great success, um, but the only manuscript survives in the hand of his composition teacher at the time, so we don't know the, to what extent it was indebted to his composition teacher. Um, all other planned operas of the 1840s and 50s remain the embryos of ambition, and there they are on your screen. Uh, you can see quite a range of topics. Um, this scattergun approach to great literary uh, topics indicates the breadth of Liszt's ambition. 
But I think it also underscores the extent to which his desire to link literature and music, uh, the premise of symphonic poetry, may first have been kindled within the aesthetic potential of opera. Like Beethoven's aborted opera Macbeth or Mendelssohn's Lorelei, uh, Liszt endeavors have garnered scholarly interest principally for reasons of curiosity and melancholy. Why were they abandoned? What have we lost? The case of Southern Apollo is unique in that it is, it is the only opera for which Liszt wrote any significant music. He devotes 110 pages to it at the start of the music book we just saw. And among his Weimar papers, there survives an accompanying 36-page prose scenario. This was long thought to be uh, the basis for the opera's libretto. But it turns out to be a scenario that Liszt solicited and ultimately rejected from the French playwright Felicien Malefi, on which more in a moment. Now, the music and text underlay of the manuscript N4 have been known to scholars for over a century, but they've been largely ignored on account of their seeming illegibility, uh, incompleteness, and the uh, presumed futility of piecing it all together. I first became aware of the manuscript while a student uh, in Leipzig, um, so I took the train to, an archive, to the archive in Weimar. I was expecting really to find uh, the beginnings of material for an opera, themes, uh, possibly a, a few lines set, uh, but not a lot more than that. Um, I didn't open the manuscript at the first page, I just took a clump of pages, and the item I first came to was um, an aria for soprano or tenor, it wasn't clear at that time, um, but it was surprising. Uh, the, um, the music seemed clearly written, the vocal line was complete with ornamentation, text underlay, the accompaniment also seemed to be relatively complete. And I listened to this in my head, and I, um, it really was a, a, a striking moment, and I thought, well, there's something we can do with this. Um, I couldn't get it out of my head uh, for a while, um, and so, uh, and here we are now, I suppose. But let's have a look at that aria. Um, this is the music that I saw. Um, so, you can see that it starts clearly enough with everything written out, and simple repeat signs tell you to repeat there. No repeat signs here, and then common A, B, uh, repeat the last two bars. Sometimes you get even up to F um, in this, this matter. You can see also that the, uh, the vocal line is absolutely complete. Uh, even with, with revisions here, uh, if we go over the page, there we are, C, D. He's repeating previously the right hand. Um, again, revisions, but it's really quite well written out. So, if you have a listen to it, you can see that, that there's something there. As I said, scholars had known about this manuscript for some time. It was catalogued uh, by Peter Raba in 1910, but it was more or less declared um, illegible uh, and certainly discontinuous. Here's a selection of, of some comments. Humphrey Searles, a very distinguished uh, scholar, Liszt scholar, and a very knowledgeable Liszt scholar, uh, his statement from 1954 is typical, that the sketches are for the most part extremely fragmentary. But the scruffiness is deceptive. The vocal lines are continuous, as we saw and the accompaniment is also legible. Uh, its continuity is not always immediately apparent, though, because of various abbreviations and the implied repetitions in the accompaniment that we've seen. Um, so, uh, coming across this, it was a little bit like you know, witnessing a crime. Uh, you have a duty to report what you've seen, 
Um, and so that was certainly at the front of my mind uh, as I thought how, how to possibly take this forward. But to get a sense of the distance traveled between what we've just heard, um, I'd like to just uh, listen to what this sounds like with orchestra. Now that aria, it turns out, was for soprano, not for tenor. Um, this is an aria for Mira. She's an Ionian slave. She was taken from her homeland by the Assyrian king, his army. Um, and her characteristic is that she is, um, she's in love with the king, but she's riven. She doesn't, uh, she, she, she feels guilt at loving the man who destroyed her home. Now in this aria, she tries to persuade him that he must go to war to defend his realm. Um, I'll come on to the characters uh, a little later, but she persuades him ultimately with her lyricism. So here's the text and the music. demonstrates if we read this manuscript consecutively across the spatial gaps and through the shorthand, we find that it's not fragmentary at all, but continuous. It corresponds to what appears to be almost the entirety of the first uh, act for the planned opera, Southern, Southern Apollo, and it was notated between February and April 1850. Now, transcription and interpretation are inherently interwoven activities, of course, and what Stephen Greenblatt once dubbed the dream of the master text remains a cautionary editorial trope. In other words, a perfectly authoritative, problem-free manuscript text doesn't exist. Nevertheless, while there are many more problematic passages uh, than this one, uh, when you read the score in the context of Liszt's notational habits and interpret the various shorthand rather than simply reading them literally, the music reveals itself to be virtually complete, analytically speaking. The cardinal elements of harmony, rhythm, melody, counterpoint, uh, often texture as well, uh, these are clearly stated. 
The evidence suggests then that Liszt had completed a full version of the music for this act, but this needs interpreting in light of his notational practice to be performable. The only exception to this, uh, that statement is really that at the very end of the manuscript, Liszt doesn't actually give us the final bar. This is the last page of the manuscript. So uh, you can see that um, uh, this is after a march, and uh, he sets up a pattern uh, which repeats, and we have A, B, C, D, E, F here, repeating the same pattern. It's all over a dominant pedal, um, so something is going to happen afterwards in D major, but this doesn't tell us what. Um, so uh, it w in order to make it performable, it was necessary to add 19 bars, 19 measures uh, at the end of the uh, work. Uh, and that was done based on firstly transposing the march theme that came earlier. It, it arrives in E flat, so it's transposed into D, um, and then simply adding a stretto uh, at the end based on themes that occurred uh, uh, um, earlier in the act. Okay, in the event, Liszt set aside the opera in 1852 and never returned to it. Why? Principally, I think, because he never received a revised versified libretto for Acts 2 and 3, and so he couldn't set them to music. And he chose not to continue pressing his friend, the Italian writer and refugee uh, princess, Cristina Belgioioso, who had procured the librettist, um, uh, but then became professionally uh, preoccupied with the wars of Italian independence, uh, such a distraction that she could no longer help Liszt, and Liszt would never return to the opera. I think it's telling that not only did he not return to it, but nor did he recycle any material from it uh, when he would have had the option to do so. There are various things we could, uh, uh, conclusions we could draw from that, uh, uh, that fact, um, one of which would be that the work held a special status for him, perhaps. This is Christina. From 1841, at the height of his powers as a virtuoso pianist, uh, this is the time of what Heine would call Listomania, Liszt tells Belgioioso that a major opera would secure his status as a, as a serious composer. Within three years, he says, I'll end my career in Vienna and in Pest, where I began it. But before then, during the winter of 1843, I want to premiere an opera in Venice. This, he felt, would, be, uh, would redress the imbalance that critics like Schumann had outlined uh, in public. Um, this was a, a review of Liszt's Transcendental Studies, the second and most virtuosic version where Schumann declares that there's a disconnect or um, discrepancy, a misverhältnis between the, uh, the, the pianist ability, who's marching ahead, and the composer's ability, which is falling behind. And I think this probably stung uh, Liszt, um, which is why burning ambition is really at the heart of, of this project. Close acquaintances were also prodding him in this direction, in the direction of opera, not least his future son-in-law, Richard Wagner. Speaking of Liszt's incidental music to Faust, which emerged from his attempt to compose an opera on the Faust story, uh, Marguerite would have been called, Wagner writes, I compare the unrest in your music to the claw by which I recognize the lion but now I call out to you, show us the complete lion. In other words, write or finish soon an opera. Um, now Liszt wanted to emulate Rossini's success, uh, perhaps even to secure Donizetti's post in, uh, at the Kerpner or Theater in Vienna. This, along with Liszt's proudly Italian collaborator, Belgioioso, perhaps helps explain the distinctly Italianate chorus uh, at the beginning of the opera with its waltz-like theme, albeit notated in 6-4. So let's have a quick listen to that. <laughs> 
one of the more memorable reactions to the premiere in Germany, I remember, was uh, a critic telling me that it was remarkable how fluid Liszt was in his Verdi. <laughs> Now, the choice of topic was in line with literary taste during the 1840s. The last king uh, of Assyria was uh, highly relevant. Byron had written a five-act uh, verse tragedy uh, on it in 1821. Uh, this was first translated into French in 1827, and Liszt had a copy of that translation. Um, Liszt admired Byron, perhaps, as a, uh, a literary hero almost uh, second to none. Uh, he visited his ancestral home in Newstead Abbey in, in England uh, to pay homage. Uh, he also writes uh, in 1839 about a chance encounter with a gondolier in Venice, uh, where the gondolier had apparently also transported Byron uh, around the waterways of Venice a couple of decades earlier. Um, and then in 1844, he tells his lover, Marie Dagold, Byronism eats away at me. So it was a very deep-rooted um, association. Now, Byron's tragedy of Sardanapalus conflates uh, the historical ac account of Diodorus Siculus into a single day. Um, it was intended to be read, actually, rather than performed, uh, enacted on stage. Uh, London's Gentleman's Magazine declared the name, uh, its title a name familiar to most, and while its dedication to Goethe only appeared in editions from 1829 uh, onwards, by this time it had already inspired Eugène Delacroix's famous, uh, uh, really uh, very large uh, oil, La Mort de Sardinapal, 1827, and it would prompt Berlioz to compose a cantata, La Dénière Nuit de Sardinapal, uh, and even Verdi considered an opera on this topic, but declined it on uh, the basis that it was too similar to Nabucco. During the 19th century, though, there were uh, no fewer than six operatic settings. Uh, starting in 1844, Liszt knew the libretto for the, the 1844 setting by uh, Pietro Rotondi, um, but it appears he didn't particularly take any interest in the subsequent settings. Um, the only other thing to add is that at this point, you have to remember, various artifacts were coming back from the historical Mesopotamia uh, and being taken to the Louvre or to the British uh, Museum. They spoke to the, the historical imagination of this period, um, adding fuel to the, the interest. Even later in the century, there are uh, depictions of uh, Sardar Nepal. This is from Ford Maddox Brown. Uh, 10 years before the end of the century. So what about the story of, of Byron's play? Well, Byron's, uh, Byron's play tells the story of a peace-loving king, effeminate in his tastes, drawn to wine, women, and feasts more than <coughs> politics and war. He devotes his attentions to his favorite concubine, Mira, um, but his subjects find him dishonorable. They call him, Byron describes him as a silkworm, a man queen. Some rebels who are discontented with his rule seek to overthrow him. The king pardons two of them, but importantly, yes, he doesn't execute them. This is seen as a sign of weakness, um, and uh, it leads only to a larger uprising. And at this point, the Euphrates rises and floods its banks, destroying the main defensive wall of his palace, which means that defeat is inevitable. So he sends away his, uh, his family. He tells Mira to go as well, but she refuses. He sends away his treasure, he gives it to the equivalent of his Praetorian Guard, and off they go. His final uh, uh, soldiers are commanded to put scents and spices kindling on the bed, and he and Mira uh, 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 lie on the bed as it's set on fire, and they self-immolate. Byron describes this as not a mere pillar formed of cloud and flame, but a light to lessen ages, rebel nations, and voluptuous princesses. The point was, it was an unrepeatable act, uh, so excruciatingly painful, no one would dare copy. Um, for his part, Liszt writes to Belgioioso that his finale will even aim to set fire to the entire audience. <laughs> but rest assured, I'm told that such things are not permitted in the Library of Congress. <laughs> Now, Liszt's um, first act has three characters, and it's in four scenes. 
The focus is really on the internal, the psychological struggles of the king and Mirra. We have the king, uh, he, so as we've uh, heard, he is effeminate, he abhors violence and he seeks peace. He wants mutual self-benefit. Uh, he wants people to respect uh, uh, each other without the need for brutal demonstrations, violence. Um, but this unwillingness to go to war uh, is his ultimate downfall, his undoing. So he becomes a, a, something close to a, a Byronic hero, I think, in that respect. Um, Mirra, uh, the favorite concubine, yes, she, I mentioned she is riven. Um, she describes herself as a slave mocked by fate. She, she, it is never resolved. The king doesn't understand why she's unhappy. He, he, talks of, he invokes natural imagery. He says, the, uh, the earth loves the sun, the stars love the sky, and our love is pure, except there's a grand duet at the end of uh, scene three. Um, but she, uh, but she, he doesn't really understand why she's unhappy. And when he presses her on the matter, she says simply, well, my adulterous role carries no dignity when your wife is around. You know, which is, um, yeah, understandable. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Belezo, a bass baritone, um, actually he has exactly the same range as Wotan, interestingly. Uh, uh, das Rheingott would be, would be composed in 1854, so just a couple of years after this. Um, Belezo is a priest, an elder statesman. He reads the stars and he predicts the downfall of the regime. The weight of the empire is on his shoulders. He, he carries its dignity and he always tells the king, you have to listen to the inner voice of duty. Um, and you can't afford to ignore this, otherwise your subjects won't respect the crown that you wear. Um, and in the end, in the play, he rebels against the king. Uh, but in Act One, he's he's still with him. Okay, there is a pre there is a plot summary that's in more detail in your booklets. Uh, so the only uh, points I draw out of that are that really Mira has this internal struggle. Um, and uh, the other point is that the king's inner conflict uh, comes down to a very important line uh, in the, the final scene where he says, every glory is a lie if it must be bought with the tears of afflicting humankind. In other words, there's no glory in being a monarch if it means you have to murder uh, women and children, your subjects, and so on. Um, so uh, we might say that the king is overthrown for being too peaceful. Um, Right, um, the point, uh, last point from the plot I would make is that um, Mira's love for the king is genuine. And at the end of her, her scene, uh, scene two, a cabaletta, we have this astonishing virtuosic um, uh, uh, passage, these triplet roulades, with a quite remarkable cadenza just built up of broken chords. So as a way of affirming that this is a genuine love for the king, uh, then I thought we might listen to that. Her, her words, her text is, in my anxious rapture, his gaze fixed upon me. My heart was blessed with indescribable contentment. associated with retrieving the libretto, uh, and for Liszt too, uh, for, uh, for uh, achieving it in the first place. Firstly, Liszt spoke very little Italian. 
So he decided to go through an intermediary, Christina Belgioioso, I mentioned, who's quite a colorful character and also a, person, a close personal friend. Now, Malafie, Felicia Malafi was the uh, French playwright that Liszt contracted. It's extraordinary that he would contract a French playwright to produce a prose scenario, which he then planned to have translated into Italian and versified, so he was perhaps making life difficult for himself from the beginning. But in any case, Malafi missed two deadlines um, and so was fired. Um, <laughs> Liszt was actually very annoyed about this. He's a, quite a characteristically generous and, and a modest person. But you can see here that this really upset him. This is a letter to uh, Jules Janin, a French drama critic, where he says, well, it's obvious that our Shakespeare will not or cannot come up with a suitable scenario for Sardana Palo. Well, others will manage it, and certainly quicker than he. To hell, then, with Malafi's Sardana Palo. So he was, he was very annoyed. Um, now, at this point, he agreed with Bel Belgioioso that she could contract uh, a, a poet, but she never names the poet. Why? We think because he was a political prisoner, and Christina, as a member of the aristocracy, would have had her correspondence opened by Habsburg spies. So instead, they used the soubriquet uh, Nightingale. So this, this poet is called the Nightingale, um, who's had his wings clipped because he's in prison. Um, he agrees, through Christina, to write a libretto. He produces a libretto for Act One. Um, Liszt is happy with that, and in fact, that is the text that he sets uh, in the manuscript. Um, eventually, uh, he receives Acts 2 and 3, but before then, he gets impatient. There's 18 months between receiving Act 1 and anything else. He must have written to Christina to say that, I can't wait any longer, and I'm going to accept uh, the terms that uh, Giovanni Tadolini uh, has given me. Now, Tadolini, uh, you may know as the uh, a person who completed Rossini's Stabon Martin, 1833, and actually the letter that we, where this evidence exists is here in the library. So this is a letter Liszt wrote to his secretary, Belloni. Anyway, when Christina heard that Liszt was going to move on, she writes back to him immediately and says, oh, this saddens me because I have in my drawer the most beautiful Sardana Palo in the world, the fruit of toil and slavery of that same poet whom I first addressed myself. Um, so in other words, she, uh, she said that uh, the, the poet who did Act One can do Acts Two and Three, and he did. Um, but he was in prison. Now, in the 19th century, um, being in prison uh, was expensive. If you, if you didn't pay, then you, you, you lived with the rats. Um, and so the poet was in need of money. And uh, after Liszt explains how the money will be paid um, via his secretary, uh, he makes an important request to Christina. He says, only permit me one last prayer. Namely, that you make it your business to take the trouble to reread the whole libretto, and if needs be, that you tell the poet directly about the revisions you consider necessary. So, in other words, he wants it to emerge under her authority. Okay, now, uh, the upshot is that Liz probably never knew the identity of his librettist, and in fact, we still don't know who it is. But we do know that it was based on Byron's play because there are some direct borrowings. A good example is this one here. Um, this uh, antithesis between the distaff, which is a kind of spinning spindle, um, and the sword. Uh, you find it here in Byron's text, and then you find this line, lascia il fuso in pugno al brando, set aside the distaff, grasp the sword. And we heard that actually in the first aria uh, this afternoon. Um, so it seems clear that Byron's text was the text that was being used by the librettist. Uh, Liszt was, shows some indication that he was aware that language was going to be a problem. Um, he, he joked to a, 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 a friend, a colleague, a dramatist, Edouard von Bauenfeld, that he's writing an opera, the first act in Italian, the second in French, the third in German. <laughs> Um, so he, he could joke about this in 1846, um, six years before abandoning the project on account of its libretto. But finally, in 1850, he did set to work producing 110 pages of music for piano and voices. Um, and the composition draft was to be orchestrated by Joachim Raff. So how far did he get? Right. Um, well, if these are, very broadly speaking, the normal stages of... Uh, uh, composing an opera in the 19th century, he gets about here. 
Um, so uh, there's, there's just enough for us to be able to uh, talk about a work, but um, there would have been more. There would have been two more acts. Uh, now, you may have noticed that in some of the examples that we've seen on screen, that the libretto uh, appears to be incomplete. Uh, indeed, it is. Um, the, there is no separate source for the libretto. So the only way that we know what the text would have been is from Liszt's own underlay in the music manuscript. Liszt was working from the libretto. It would have been on his desk as he's, as he's composing, but we don't have it. It's not in the archive. Um, and uh, it might be in someone's attic somewhere, but we haven't got it yet. I've been very lucky in this project to work with three uh, brilliant colleagues, uh, Marco Begheli, uh, Francesca Vella, and David Rosen, uh, uh, all of whom, with various different tasks uh, and responsibilities, have worked to reconstruct uh, the libretto. Um, most of the points in the, the libretto where text is missing signals a repeat of something that has already been written out and so didn't need writing out again. Um, but sometimes Liszt leaves off uh, the final word of a sentence. Sometimes he just has the consonant beginning uh, the word. And so you have to use, uh, uh, you have to deduce what, what the word might have been based on the metrical and the rhyming scheme. Um, so an example of how this might work would be here in the opening chorus. You can see that uh, we have vieni, vieni, risplendono, nothing, facci. So um, it would be possible to repeat the word uh, risplendono. Uh, uh, risplendono, risplendono, facci. But this is in a metrical scheme uh, that I'll clarify in a moment, um, where uh, it would be inappropriate to repeat within the meter the same word immediately. No self-respecting Italian poet would have done that. Um, look here, Vieni is with this characteristic gesture on this part of the bar, this part of the measure, the same here, but no Vieni. So he doesn't write it. He does write it here again. So it's reasonable to assume that he meant Vieni at this point also. Now, um, a little later on, you, you see the same, uh, the same pattern of underlay. This is interesting here because he sets oblia with the wrong accent. Uh, but underneath it, he corrects oblia, or you see, um, to an iambic uh, meter. Now, the actual meter is here, what, uh, 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 is uh, two groups of five syllables, doppio quinario. Um, where you have the main accent on the ninth and the uh, second accent on the fourth. So you have vieni, risplendono, that's the five, festive facci. Now, uh, remember I said we were unlikely to repeat risplendono. This means we have to add a word. Um, we've chosen here festive, which are festive torches, festive torches burning on the sides in, in the opening festival. But it could also have been notturne facci, or something like that. So it's an example of, we, we can't be certain about it, but um, we, can, we can certainly have a, a, a very educated uh, guess. Now, I mentioned problems of misaccentuation. Liszt's Italian uh, was, was not um, well practiced. Here's an example of, he writes uh, here, il vigile sguardo, but it should be il vigile. So it's a simple matter to correct that, um, but of course it throws up an editorial question. Should you be making that kind of correction when it's very clear what Liszt actually wrote? Um, that's a difficult one. On, um, on the basis that it seems likely Liszt would have shown this to Christina, uh, perhaps even to his secretary, Belloni, who was Italian, and they would have pointed out that this was incorrect, and then he would have corrected it, we assume. Where it's possible to make corrections that make no difference whatsoever to the accompaniment, um, the, the counterpoint, the harmony, the texture, it doesn't change any of that. Uh, it's just a surface change that we have, in this edition, made those changes. Now, there are some places where list equivocates. So here you have itene. Itene, um, 
but he wasn't sure. He, he wonders whether it should be itere, itere. In fact, he was right first time. Um, so that's easy. We take this one. Other cases are too embedded in the uh, rhythm f to, to be changed. It, it would be too invasive. So the actual location where all this takes place is uh, the capital of ancient Assyria, Nineveh. Um, now, Liszt uh, sets this Ninive, you can see there. Um, now, it's impossible to change that so that the accent is on the first syllable. And he was probably responding to how this was pronounced in, in French and German, where it, there is the accent, I think, on the second syllable. Um, so, in this case, we've, we've just left it. Now, what are the challenges in rescuing this music? Well, why has it lain silent for so long? Um, unfinished music has a poetic quality. Uh, the sketches can reveal a lot about artistic, the artistic process that's otherwise concealed. And this is perhaps why unfinished works are so attractive to us. They open a window onto the creative process more transparently than refined compositions, both the intellectual decisions and the technical means by which composers sought to create something. You might call this a forensic allure. Here is a statement by the Roman historian Pliny the Elder, uh, where he says, well, unfinished pictures are more admired than those which the artists finished, because in them are seen the preliminary drawings left visible and the artists' actual thoughts. We find a similar sentiment in the 19th century. Um, here is Shelley, who says, well, when composition begins, inspiration is already on the decline, and the most glorious poetry that has ever been communicated to the world is probably a feeble shadow of the original conception. Uh, uh, more specifically musical is Schopenhauer here, who speaks of the work done at one stroke, uh, being perfected in the inspiration of the first conception and drawn unconsciously, as it were, um, and he likens this to melody. Um, in this context, Karl Maria von Weber even spoke of Mozart's sketches as dear relics. Now, a few years ago, there was an exhibition uh, in New York at the Met um, called Unfinished, which celebrated precisely this aesthetic in the visual arts. But music is not like painting in, in this respect. It needs performance. It needs active realization in sound. We can read an incomplete verse, a sonnet. We can take pleasure from contemplating the unfinished strokes of a pencil. Um, but the pleasure of reading uh, a manuscript that's incomplete in an archive is an antiquarian pleasure. To be experienced as music, it needs performance. Music sensory realization sets it apart in this context. Um, for an incomplete work to be heard and experienced as music, then, an editor needs to make decisions, even when those decisions have to be taken on the basis of incomplete data. Um, I'd mention then at this point that I think the normal ethical obligation on editors, which is that you never add anything, uh, that you must, only, uh, you must only take your best sources and, and use your critical apparatus to produce the best edition, uh, that um, the ethical obligation is almost flipped in this context where the, the question becomes, do, do I as a scholar have a right to leave something that is nearly completed silent? You know, do I have the right to, to let it sit there? Or does it need to be heard? Um, does the, does that, should it be um, given to the world as a kind of social property? And I think that's an interesting ethical question. I'd like to just share with you some of the challenges in bringing this to uh, to, to light. So I've divided these into four categories. Gaps are probably the most uh, significant aspect of, uh, of the score that, that gave others pause. Three large gaps exist in the accompaniment above which cont uh, multiple continuous vocal parts are written. Uh, this is the first one, um, which can be taken as representative. Now you can see that this begins with a, a big march here, um, and then the, the tenor comes in, the tenor part is all written out, um, but the accompaniment falls away. Initially, we have a bass line, and then no bass line until here. Uh, but we do have a full uh, vocal line written out, even a correction to the vocal line, and it carries on. Now, um, the point that I'd like to make is that this, um, this music sets up a pattern. 
a, a simple Italian uh, copper metal pattern here. And the implication is that the pattern is to continue. It's not a particularly um, difficult pattern, uh, etc. Uh, we have the... etc. Um, so, without too much difficulty, one can uh, divine the, the complement here. Now, some harmonic decisions have to be taken here, but they're not within the stylistic parameters of the genre. They're not that difficult. And Liszt adds the bass notes where there seems to be any question of what uh, it might be. Let's have a, a quick listen to some section there. <laughs> and the, these kind of uh, uh, eighth figures here, it's quite possible to replicate this kind of figure. Uh, this is the score that we just heard, um, where the violas again have the sustained pitches. And this is the division uh, that Liszt specifies in the manuscript very closely. I'll come on to orchestration in just a second. Um, the other points, though, to, to draw from that, you remember the melody goes... Now, if you think of the, the rhythm, it's a very similar rhythm, in fact, it's an like identical rhythm to uh, the theme that Liszt used from Bellini, Suoni la tromba, uh, from I Puritani, where he wrote a set of variations. I think there's a sense of certainly borrowing on that, but the, the key difference is that whereas Liszt's music moves between these uh, keys a third apart, that you wouldn't find in Bellini. Um, there's a similar moment actually for the tenor uh, where he, he used the word in pace. It's the last moment in the opera before he takes the decision to go to war, a decision he takes in a, a very particular coordinate rest. Uh, he says, in, in pace, and there's an osseo written above it. Now that harmony, 11th chord, very similar to uh, uh, music this would write. For instance, in the song, uh, Ihr Glocken von Marling, where you have these, uh, these pitches repeated. But, so the point is we're dealing, there's strong evidence that we're dealing with Liszt's own voice here. Now, uh, another challenge is um, what I call patterning or internal cross-referencing. Here, this is really not very promising uh, from an editorial point of view. Um, there's a lot, the, the pitch information's not too bad, um, but the, the rhythm really is, is difficult and there's a lot of uh, indecision. So I don't think I'd be confident looking uh, at that and producing something that we could work. But by looking forward in the manuscript, you can cross-reference. This actually is a bridge passage between two verses in, in a march. At the end of that, you have this, which is, as you can see, although there are 16 rests inserted where they're not there previously, 
you can see that it's the same pictures with some differences, but uh, it's the same gesture uh, with the added octave. So by interpreting the difficult section in light of the clearer, later section, we can achieve something like this, um, which uh, I think is uh, pretty close to what it, what it is. Um, another challenge is where Liszt changes his mind. Now here you can see, initially this is written in 3-4. You can see that very clearly by looking at this bass line here. Um, but along the side, suddenly he says common time in four. So we change from a triple to a, a duple meter. And um, he doesn't actually specify very clearly how this theme in the left hand, in the bass here, is meant to be uh, changed. Um, so again, I wouldn't be very confident uh, about that uh, unless there was something to compare it to. And fortunately there is. Later on we have the same theme um, here, perfectly written in common time. So we can use the latter to interpret the former. In 3-4, the theme would sound something like this. In 4-4, four, four, appears to be what you might call a, a data insufficiency. Um, here's an example. We have the key signature here, four naturals, and quite a number of uh, sharps and flats written, but not, uh, as we'll see, that actually end up making sense in a particular context. Now, if we go forward, the next key signature we get is not until uh, here, which is also four naturals. Now, um, Obviously, there's a question, why would he need to write four naturals after uh, a passage that uh, appears not to need cancelling? There are no sharps or flats that, that, that need to be undone. <coughs> Similarly, if, we, if you play this literally, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, here, you have this C sharp there against F and D. Is that a D natural? Um, <coughs> And as it carries on, even just in the, the melody line, D flat, is that also D flat, or is it, is that a D? Um, it doesn't make uh, uh, easy sense here. Um, there's a D flat. What about this chord here, as it's written? It's, uh, the, the point I want to get to is that Liszt is thinking in F minor. Um, it just didn't write the, the key signature out. And the, if, you, if you take the kind of ag aggregate of all the uh, accidentals, then they add up to something which strongly suggests F minor. And actually, the, the theme is quite clear. <laughs> uh, this wouldn't work uh, if it were... Uh, uh, written, uh, that's the section I just played, but there's no A flat, D flat, <laughs> etc. Um, uh, so it, it needs to be read in context. There are other sections where the ambiguity is not so, um, is not so clear. The declamatory style, which we'll hear uh, in this moment, particularly from Beleso, um, was important to Liszt. In an essay he wrote on Berlioz's Harold Symphony, we get the famous term program music, very important for Liszt. But we also get the emphasis, uh, an emphasis on declamatory style. In fact, he pairs the two as the roots to the future. Uh, we consider the introduction of the program to be just as inevitable as the declamatory style is to the opera. These two trends are imperative necessities. So it's very tempting to look at the music for Southern Opera in light of these comments that Liszt was trying to modernize Italian opera. He was trying to, in a sense, monumentalize it uh, to, to render the dramatic element of it more significant. Now, um, a, a good example of that is here. A, a, a tiny example, but you can see Liszt doesn't need to break this line. The soprano has a rising line, but he does break it. Um, we have... Um, 
etc. Uh, but he does break it, so there can be an emphasis on Senor, um, another example of how he wants to dramatize uh, the delivery rather than accede to a pure bel canto aesthetic. Um, now, there are sections where the musical information is not enough. So here, we're in a key signature of uh, C-sharp minor, and the tenor enters, uh, in, has a statement in C-sharp minor, then has a statement in D major. There. Now here, if you read this literally, you get this. List is perfectly capable of writing augmented uh, 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 chords that alternate with diminished seventh chords. Uh, that's quite germane to his style. But in this context, it sticks out a lot. Um, so if you read this literally, that F sharp stands. Um, and I wondered whether there was a different interpretation where he would have intended that to be an F natural. So we have. from the text. So here, the king has entered, and he sees the mirror, she's upset, she's crying, and uh, he says, well, uh, you know, in your sad and solitary room mirror, tell me, dimmi, tell me, girl, fanciulo, angelo mio. Um, the words on the, uh, this harmonic change is exactly fanciulo, angelo mio. So it's a softening. Uh, it's a, a kind of um, a warmer aesthetic. So for that reason, it seemed inappropriate to have this, which um, traditionally in opera, uh, in uh, Weber, Marschner, and so on, is actually the diminished, or you know, triads end up being associated with the supernatural, with ghosts. So that's not really as appropriate. So we went for the F natural, in other words. Okay, and now that's also going to play. There we are. Right. Um, last little example. This is a rare case of where this does not give us the texture. So this is the very end of what the, um, what the singers uh, have in the opera. You can see he just gives us a two-part counterpoint. But look at the vocal parts, completely written out. So if you, this is what he gives you. So based on, on fairly straightforward harmony and by looking at the, the uh, vocal part, it's not hard to see that this is... And then what to do with it? Well, there's been a very strong uh, pattern of 16th going on. Uh, so to keep the syncopation between the lines and simply continue um, the, the rhythm, you can just uh, rhythmicize the chord. Etc. So something like that is what we ended up doing. Very briefly now, uh, orchestration. There are a number of cues in the orchestration. Uh, list explicitly wanted to give the score to his assistant to orchestrate Joachim Raff. Raff writes to uh, a close friend in December 1851, confirming he was expecting the score. So he writes here horns, for instance, a viola, timpani, the very opening clarinet and oboe, and here the accompanimental arrangement of first and second violins. Sometimes it's quite clear. You have clarinet, oboe there, clarinet again. So you can see how this sounds. Places uh, you have to work it out by um, uh, negatively, by what isn't there. So, for instance, here you can see the start of what appears to be a common horn motif. Etc. But um, 
you can see this then arrives here where uh, it modulates and he writes horns. So we know that this is new. That's, these are not horns. We also know that he means uh, this four bar unit to be in one group, this four bar unit to be in one group, and the third, there's a third uh, iteration, to be in a different group. So this is what it sounds like. Now, in other places, we have part stratification. So you get the different parts set out on different lines. And these are quite, uh, uh, quite clear, even though there is no indication as to what instruments should play which parts. So I want you to just play this and then see if you can guess what the model is for this particular passage. February 1849, about which he, create, uh, he wrote an extended essay, including details of orchestration and uh, on whose themes he uh, composed two piano transcriptions. Uh, I'm talking, of course, of Tannhäuser, uh, which is also in E major, the Pilgrim's Chorus. Ah, well, here's an example of the fullest stratification of parts. Very briefly, timpani, brass, lower strings, upper strings, woodwind, vocal parts. So some of this is very clear. And if you compare it to a symphonic poem, this is Tasso, um, you can see that the, the short score is very uh, similar. Uh, and this was the score that Liszt gave for provisional orchestration to his then assistant, August Conradi. Um, final example from orchestration and final uh, point of the talk. Here, um, we have a theme in the left hand. Now, uh, Liszt was in the process of preparing Lohengrin in uh, 1850. Um, there were no bass clarinets in Thuringia. Um, and he needed a bass clarinet for the second act of Lohengrin. So he sent his secretary to Paris to go and buy one. And then he, he wiping his brow, you can imagine, he writes to Wagner, we have a bass clarinet, you know, we, we've got one. And so it seems to make sense for him to pair it. Now you, you may recall in the famous interdiction, <laughs> Wagner will pair the core anglais and the bass clarinet together in octaves, and you would get this sort of icy black sound, very characteristic uh, for, for the time. It seems an obvious pairing, so it was one that, uh, that I took up for this particular theme. <laughs> 
Well, it was written at a t an extraordinarily fertile time for Liszt, the time of the four earliest symphonic poems, the B minor sonata, the final version of the Dante sonata, the first two piano concertos, uh, a revision of Totentanz, several sacred choruses, psalm settings, it goes on. So we're dealing here with a slice of a major work from one of Liszt's richest compositional periods. Um, the edition that we'll hear today is based on the evidence that Liszt had a detailed, worked out conception of the music for Act One. Um, and we might say then that what survives of Sardanapolo constitutes a fragment, but in Schlegel's sense, of something that is complete in itself and yet essentially incomplete in its opposition to other fragments. A fragment, you recall, like a small work of art, Schlegel famously remarks, has to be entirely isolated from the surrounding world and complete in itself. Um, it uh, obtains a certain unity even while uh, it remains incomplete in the perspective that it opens up. This old paradox would seem to capture well the identity of Sardanapolo's single act for us in 2019. So I thank you very much for your kind attention and I'd better get off stage now. Check the series of stories.